Okay, we seem to have stabilized in terms of our number of uh, participants. So I think I'm gonna go ahead and get started. Um, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome. My name is Hillary Godwin, and I'm the Dean of the University of Washington School of Public Health. Um, thank you for joining us for our third conversation in the annual Health Equity Lecture Series. Um, today, we're very excited to welcome a panel of public health researchers and practitioners who will dig into the concept of environmental justice and discuss what it means to center on community expertise in their work to promote environmental health and dismantle systems of oppression. Um, this is a topic that's near and dear to my heart. Um, for those of you who don't know, I'm actually an environmental health person myself um, and I'm deeply committed to environmental justice. That's part of what brought me to the field of public health. Um, so, um, you know, this series, I have loved this series that has been um, we've just had wonderful panelists and, and been really pleased with our, our student moderators. So um, excited to continue in that vein. Um, and oh, I wanted to mention, so I love all of our panelists, but I wanted to mention BJ Cummings wrote this awesome book. Um, so if you guys haven't read it, highly recommend it. That's my free advertising. Um, so um, yeah, so before we continue, I'd like to acknowledge um, uh, that although we are meeting on Zoom, um, that all of us are calling in from uh, Indigenous lands. Um, I personally am calling in from uh, the land of the Suquamish people um, and uh, in the Puget Sound region where um, many of the people calling in live and work, um, we recognize the Coast Salish people of this land, the land of the Suquamish, Tulalip, Duwamish, and Muckleshoot nations. And uh, we say these words to honor uh, the people who are living here still and on whose lands we are guests. Um, it's particularly appropriate for an environmental justice talk. We honor the wonderful stewardship um, that the original inhabitants of these lands have um, shepherded this these lands in since time immemorial um, and uh, we strive um, to um, to live up to the high standards that they have set uh, a bit of housekeeping um, if you have questions for the panel um, please use the q a function so we use the chat box not for asking questions but for sharing information so you're welcome um, to post things in uh, the chat box if there are resources that you want to share. Um, I can see that um, someone shared, thank you, Liz, shared um, the link to uh, BJ's book and also to a wonderful resource um, if people are interested in learning more about um, the original inhabitants of uh, the lands um, that they live on, um, which is nativeland.ca, a great website. Um, if you want to ask questions, however, please use that Q&A um, function. Um, and if you have a specific panelist that you'd like to direct them to, you can indicate that person's name. If not, um, I'm sure Orly will do a fantastic job of trying to direct them to um, the appropriate panelist. Um, I do want to let people know that we are recording this event um, to make it available on our website and on our YouTube YouTube channel um, for future viewing. Um, so if you are participating and you registered, um, you should receive a link um, to that uh, after the fact. Um, this event is also being live captioned um, and you can select captioning um, in the bar at the bottom of your screen where it says live transcript. So with that, um, I just wanted to thank again, all of our panelists for joining us today and um, turn over the event to Orly Stamford, who's um, a wonderful uh, graduate student in our environmental and occupational health sciences um, department and is going to serve as our moderator today. So I I'm, may turn off my video because sometimes I'm distracting to people, um, but uh, although I, I don't think any of you guys really find me that intimidating, um, but I am I'm here watching and listening um, eagerly and look forward to hearing what you guys have to say. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Orly. Great, thank you, Hillary. Um, so as Hillary said, my name is Orly and I'll be the moderator this evening. 
Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to be part of this discussion with Mohammed, Esther, and BJ. Um, so first we'll start with some introductions. Uh, Mohammed, would you like to go first? Sorry, I was mute. Yeah, thank you, Orly. So yeah, I am honored to be part of this panel and thank you, Hilary and the rest of the team who invited me to be on this panel. My name is Mohammed Ali. I work at public health. I do manage a childhood led poisoning program which comes under residential service program. And I'm also a proud SPH alumni, the first the MPH cohort to graduate new global health department in 2008. And after graduating in 2008, I have done some work with working with multiple health programs from infectious diseases to emergent preparedness in various nonprofit organizations that eventually resulted in creating a Somali health board number of the organization in 2011. In 2012, I had the honor of receiving National Community Hero Award from the Federal Emergency Management Administration, FEMA, and also followed White House Champions of Change Award in 2013. I'm still involved with the department and uh, being a clinical instructor at uh, health services. I'm also very grateful to be selected and recognized as among the 50 alumni change makers of the UW School of Public Health's 50 years of impact. Uh, my other three times I spend also local, state, and also global health issues being part of the being a board of directors of this organization that is that includes. So Mali Health Board for local health issues, statewide for Washington State Public Health Association, and I'm also a member of the Board of Directors of Health Alliance International. So that is what I do, and that's who I am. Thank you. Back to you, Orly. Thanks, Mohammed. Um, Esther, would you like to go next? Yeah, thanks, Orly. Hi, everybody. My name is Esther, um, she, her pronouns, and I am also a recent graduate from the Department of Environmental and Occupational Health Sciences. And now I also currently work as a research consultant for the department. Um, my work primarily focuses on academic community partnerships for research to action work, um, whether it's research or whether it's more public health practice. And I also do a lot of geospatial mapping analysis. Um, a lot of my work mainly is based in Washington State, um, but in my previous life, I've also done some work down in California around water justice issues as well. Back to you, Arby. Thanks, Esther. Uh, BJ, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm BJ Cummings, and I manage uh, community engagement for the UW Superfund Research Center, as well as the UW EDGE Center, also known as the Interdisciplinary Center for Exposures, Diseases, Genomics, and the Environment. Um, here at the School of Public Health. And um, I have joined the UW community fairly recently. Um, I've spent the last 25 years uh, working primarily on the Duwamish River in South Seattle and with the Duwamish communities um, of all stripes. And uh, I've done that with a few different hats on um, as Soundkeeper and Director of Puget Soundkeeper Alliance, as Executive Director of Sustainable Seattle, and uh, most, um, mostly as the founding coordinator for the Duwamish River Cleanup Coalition. Um, and then as, uh, as Hillary so kindly pointed out, um, I spent the last five years more or less um, working on an environmental and social history of the river, which was released by UW Press uh, last year um, under the title, The River That Made Seattle. Great, thanks everyone. Um, so I'll introduce myself to I'm Orly Stamfer. I'm white. I use she, her pronouns. Um, I'm a PhD student in environmental and occupational health. Uh, and I'm also grateful to be a student in the graduate certificate program in American Indian and Indigenous Studies. And for my work, I focus on uh, community engaged air pollution research. 
So before we get into the questions, um, I wanted to provide a little bit of context for this discussion. Uh, we all met several weeks ago to talk about this panel and a central theme that came up was community engagement, which makes sense because uh, community engagement is a central part of all of our work. Um, and we talked about how in collaborative work, it's important for us to recognize our own perspectives and experiences and relationships that we bring with us to the work. So I want to acknowledge that um, this is a public health lecture series and we're public health researchers and practitioners, um, but there's a lot that we can learn from other fields that public health researchers don't often overlap with in academia. Um, including Indigenous studies, feminist studies, Black studies, and queer studies. And I'm just starting to learn from these studies. Um, and one way that they've shaped my thinking is to recognize that while Western science is often portrayed as objective, um, scientists like everyone else are and have been shaped by our experiences and perspectives. And we're conditioned by systems like colonialism, capitalism, patriarchy, and white supremacy. So it's really vital that we take an actively anti-racist approach in our work. Uh, so that brings me to our first question, which is what lens do you bring to your environmental justice work? And um, Mohammed, would you like to go first? Sorry. Yeah, so thank you again. So what I bring to environmental justice is to achieving a healthy equity lens that everybody to have a fair and just opportunity to be healthy and safe. One thing that you mentioned about the Western uh, science, which is often portrayed as an objective and it is shortcomings really one thing that I want to point out for the audience is, as a public health practitioner, normally we use our data and scientific articles that we call them evidence-based, and we translate them into practices and programs and services that we provide to the community. And that's what we do typically, and aiming to have a change to happen, whether it is behavior changing or whether it is protecting believing it to, to protect all community members in the King County. It worked for somehow, but also it did not achieve to where we aimed and what we plan to achieve by then or by now. So for example, the program that I run or I manage, which is the residential service program, we are talking about environment, whether it is outdoor or indoor. We are now talking about the micro environment that we live in which is our own home, where we spend most of our time, over 90% of our time we spend in our indoors. A lot of community members with the percentage, significant percentage are not enjoying knowingly or unknowingly the environment that they call it home. So the lens that I'm looking for is, why am I responding to all childhood lead poisoning? putting fires off of this toxic exposure, exposure and poisoning happening through people's homes. And that is what really worries me all the time. And I will let the rest of the team jump in, but that is what we practiced and used, but now we are reframing our thinking and how we program and come up with the service that we provide, which is now an inclusive and equity centric approach that I will talk later but that is what we failed in the past. We are leaving out a lot of disciplines and you mentioned some of them, feminist studies or black studies or Indian studies, all those things never being taken into account of the, what we call it, the evidence that we are taking into practices. And we were expecting everything to work because we are literally translating one into other groups and expecting to work. Back to you, Orly. Thank you, Mohammed. Um, BJ, would you like to go next? Sure. Um, 
So Orla, you already alluded to this somewhat, but um, you know, first and foremost, as far as kind of the lens I bring, um, as we all do, I bring my own lived experience. Um, you know, we all we all do that. Um, so for me to name it, um, I'm a cis white woman working in the environmental field, um, which is also overwhelmingly white. Um, I did though have a very, I guess you would say, un-Seattle upbringing um, in that I was raised in uh, in New York in Spanish Harlem by a labor organizer and a social worker, um, which really informed a lot of how I approached my environmental work and now my environmental health work. Um, and in addition, most of the environmental spaces that I've worked in throughout my career have, um, have been largely led by people of color, which is, again, kind of unusual in the environmental field. Um, and that includes here in Seattle for the past 20 or so years, 20 plus years. Um, so my lens is also informed by who I am and also uh, working in EJ communities and within four community-based organizations um, that are focused on addressing environmental health. Um, most of my role with those groups have been uh, largely you know, supportive role, um, coordinating, facilitating, translating technical information um, to community or community voices to decision makers, um, and consulting on strategies used to knock on the doors of power, um, as in all community and EJ organizing efforts, um, gaining seats at the table and building both capacity and power um, has been a central component of that work. Um, and then about 10 years ago, um, the Duwamish communities that I was working with started collaborating with research scientists to get critical environmental health questions answered um, about their own community. Um, and then I later joined the UW um, staff to help researchers directly engage these communities in their work. So today I try to serve as um, a translator and a, and a bridge between the two, um, building capacity in both to help forge productive meaningful and hopefully equitable partnerships. Great, thank you, Vijay. Uh, Aster, would you like to talk about the lens you bring to your environmental justice work? Yeah, so growing up in a different country until high school, I bring the lens of, a, of an immigrant and of a Korean because that's my home country. And I'm also part of a multicultural family. So I really value and also a, realize you know just how different we all are our upbringings our lived experiences and so I, I try to bring that to all of my work in environmental justice and I also bring that you know lens of social determinants of health to all my work and really believing that you know where we live shouldn't dictate how long our lifespan should be or how clean our air is or how clean our water is and and I really think that um, you know access to clean air water hygiene, sanitation, all of that should be and is a basic human right. And so environmental justice and social justice can't be achieved without addressing those root causes of the disparities and the systemic racism that we see today. And so these are kind of all the all the lenses I bring to, to my work in environmental justice. Great, thank you. Um, so environmental justice is, is a really big topic. Um, environmental injustice encompasses so many different things. Immediate associations that um, people might think of might be things like toxic waste sites or um, landfills being disproportionately and intentionally placed in BIPOC communities or um, issues around access to clean air and clean water. But thinking more broadly, environmental justice also speaks to dismantling systems of oppression like police abolition and returning stolen land. So I would love to hear from you, what does environmental justice mean to you? And um, how do you think environmental injustices relate to other forms of oppression and societal structures? We talked about a little bit already. Um, Esther, do you wanna go first since you and I've mentioned systemic racism as something. Yeah, so to me, environmental justice has kind of two different folds that, you know, historic harm, the distributional aspect of where the goal for environmental justice for me is for everyone to have a healthy environment, for them to, to live in, to learn, to work, play, worship, you know, all of that. 
and that, you know, the level of income or the color of your skin or your immigration status, none of those should really matter when it comes to having access to those and being able to live in a healthy environment. The second thing I think of when I think environmental justice is that procedural aspect. And so for our journey and our path to get to that environmental justice, it's only going to be possible and equitable only if communities that are in the forefront of these issues and are already experiencing them, if they're in the center of the conversation and actually the leaders of the process itself. And I think the environmental injustices and historical harms our communities are have experienced and are currently experiencing to this day is really a result of a lot of the systemic and institutional racism. And so just as an example, thinking about those redlining practices in real estate and the early 1900s and thinking about um, you know, denying home mortgages to people of color in certain neighborhoods, those types of outright discriminatory practices and other, other outright and subtle ones over time have really resulted in our communities being the haves or the haves not. And so that really creating such a tension and, and overall resulting in the environmental injustices that we see today. And so although we have so many warriors and champions that are really working towards that social equity and justice, um, I feel like with all of these systemic and other societal structures that really have been discriminatory against um, people of color and low income people that that's why environmental injustices are going to be and are still so persistent in the communities that we have. Thank you, Esther. Um, BJ, do you have anything you'd like to add to that? Um, yeah, thank you. Um, yes, to all of the above. <laughs> um, you know, and there's so many different definitions um, that you hear out there, and some of them may be more or less useful in this context. But um, I do want to add, um, there's one thing that I think is really key about one of the guiding legal definitions that's used um, for EJ. Um, and that is that in the EJ executive order of 1994, um, that ordered all federal agencies to address what the order called the disproportionately high and adverse human health or environmental effects of its actions and programs on minority and low-income communities. So basically what that line of that important um, executive order means to me is that it, environmental justice means taking action to eradicate environmental and health disparities, kind of, you know, full stop. Um, then, of course, the other thing it means is, is full participation um, by impacted communities in all levels of decision making, um, as Esther talked about, you know, whether that's for a research project or for a pub public policy, the golden rule really is nothing about us without us. Thank you, BJ. Uh, Mohammed, would you like to speak to this? Um, I agree all of the above of what Esther and BJ talked about. And one thing that I skipped in my first intro was about Madeleine's as an immigrant refugee from Somalia who lived in a refugee camps and also adjusted to a new world, which is the United States here. So that is also, that lived experience is part of me and working with the immigrants and refugees on a daily basis, that's also another perspective that I bring in and having that educational background from both continents also brings some kind of an insight to how I do and how I go about. And thus, that's also something that I forget. So this question about, we know that is a lot of communities are disproportionately impacted by pollutants in the environment, whether it is outside or the micro environment that I was talking about and then what it needs is only removing all those kind of obstacles that these communities face, whether it is um, just the, what I'm bringing the other perspective, which is, I don't know if everybody is aware of the household products that we use, whether it's cosmetics and beauty products, a lot of community members are using a toxic products, whether it is skin bleaching or any other products that they're using, which is mercury, lead stuff that people are using and whether it is the cooking and other products and food and even the water they drink sometimes are contaminated with other toxics so that is really what worries and that's really what i am bringing up to the service which is opening up our eyes 
yes, environment is uh, too broad, but at the same time, there is also other things that's really impacting our communities. Thank you. Thank you, Mohammed. Um, so often in environmental justice research and practice and public health in general, uh, we use terms like community engagement and community based very often. We've already used them a bunch of times in this conversation. Um, but we know that any community is made up of many, many, many different people with different lived experiences, perspectives, ideas, priorities, um, and also that community members and academic researchers and practitioners are not mutually exclusive groups. So in your work, um, how do you define community? And um, BJ, would you like to start? Sorry, caught me by surprise. <laughs> um, I, I'm going to be super short with this one because I'm sure Esther and Mohammed have lots of brilliant things to say. But um, basically, I define community by um, whom, whomever is directly impacted by the question or the issue or the impact at hand. Um, Mohammed, would you like to go next? Yep. Thank you. So I'm responding to this question as a, my role as a public servant at Public Health, Seattle King County. So community means is also divine according to that role. We are tasked to protect and then improve the health and well-being of the entire King County community. So that's the catchment, that's the entire community that we are calling it because we are expected color, any color, anybody to serve them. But given we have a 2.3 million residents in the county and 60,000 businesses that we serve in our program, we know that some population are at greater risk from harmful chemical exposure that is facing environmental injustices. So picking out those communities that we call them a priority community, they could be any color. They could, could, that is the priority community that we work with. In our planning for program, equity is the center for implementing because we are using a King County ESJ strategic plan that is on the books. And also our program, we have what's called a racial equity implementation plan that guides us where to spend our resources to undo the damage of the past and to contribute in achieving racial equity in King County. So there is a lot of a, a stigma, there is a lot of a segment, segmenting. And, and, and that is how we uh, pick our communities. It could be an immigrant and refugee, it could be ASL, it could be low income, it could be geographical community, for example, the services because of the data, the work that Easter and other have done has helped us to, because the funding is limited. As a public health, there is a chronic underfunded. So we are starting with that little funding and then we are now targeting the most impacted and the most needy, the who, where is the greatest need in the county. So that's how we pick our communities that we are going to serve because the data and the, the evidence is telling us with also the numbers that's generated from our calls, our response that we generate, the trends that we see. So that's how we pick our communities and that's how we define community in this setting at this moment. Great. Esther, do you wanna talk about um, defining community in your work? 
Yeah, I feel like I echo my definition is really similar to what BJ Mohammed have said and really thinking about communities I work with, they are often on the very front lines of experiencing a lot of the environmental harms, whether it's climate impacts or specific um, toxic pollution, and that have a lot of health disparities. And so the communities I work with might be agricultural workers in a rural area or might be a refugee in an urban um, in, a, in a city with limited access to, to health care. But I also like to think about the communities I work with as, you know, they're resilient and they're very strong and so the communities I work with and that I define it I try to make sure especially because in the environmental justice work that I do there are so much hurting and suffering and a lot of healing that needs to happen I really try to think about these communities as um, as thriving and resilient communities that's great um, so each of you talked about you know, communities that you work with. Um, and so I'd love to hear more too about the role that relationship building plays in your environmental um, justice practice and research. Um, Mohammed, would you like to go first? Yep. Thank you. So the question is building a relationship with the community. How important is that? Um, that is, it is a very, crucial because before I continue on that, I want to give some background of what has been done in the past, which is that tells us about the need for those kind of relation building and also trust before even we get the buy-in from the communities that we are going to serve. So public health, we do a lot of interventions responding to calls and issues and health outcomes, whether it is an, an issue that has been reported, so we have to go out and assess and investigate and then provide recommendations. So when you need to have a awareness and education and building campaign, for example, normally what we have done in the past is we continue doing it is sending out an outreach and a, an educator to bring a change. And so what has been happening is kind of just only tracking down the output and how many events have we done and how many community gatherings that we attended and those kind of uh, taking the checklist, which is output based, but at the same time, at the end of many years and centuries of doing that thing. So who is better off of that? It may have raised some awareness, but also the impact that we wanted to do or undo or repair or dismantle it still exists and it's still perpetuating, causing a lot of damage. And also other skills or methods that we use, which is putting out a request for a proposal, just a community or someone, nonprofit to apply, and then give them a scope of work to work on and give us those numbers and they have achieved those numbers. And those are some that think that still working, but at the same time, where we are and what we are trying to achieve is still a journey. We are still going in to get it. And then that trust building, because the target audience has to be part of the planning from start to, to the end. And to get that, you need first to build a relationship which builds trust which builds new leaders from the community. And then I will give you some example in the letter, but what we find out is whenever we came up with a pro equity contracting, reaching out and starting from learning from the community. So that is the time that we have seen a change. That's the time that we have seen something that we tried in the past that did not work. So now I sticking because community is part of it and being community part of it, then that at least is a really a, the beginning of that transformation of power sharing and community becoming in the front seat when it's needed. Thank you. It's great to hear. Um, Esther, would you like to speak to relationship building in your work? Yeah, I feel like um, relationship and trust is everything. And without it, you know, I, I really don't 
have anything. <laughs> I honestly approach my partnerships with my communities as I feel like I do with my friends, with my family, with my colleagues, where it's not meant to be just a one time, you know, just for this project, we're going to work together and then part our ways. It's really that that long haul for that long run. I really want to get to know them. And I and I hope that, you know, they also want to get to know me as a person, as people and and to understand where each other are coming from. And and so because of that, you know, I also want need to make sure that it's a two way relationship and I really respect that. And it's not always me talking first, always listening to them and what they have to say and me always taking the back seat um, and being an active participant in the conversation, not just flying the wall, but always, you know, making sure that I am acknowledging and remembering that I may have access to resources that will look very different from some of what these other community partners might have access to and understanding that there is that there could be and most definitely will be a power difference and, and, and other differences that really need to be um, thought of when you're approaching these types of relationships and, and these long-term trust building um, partnerships. And so this foundation building of that trust and that relationship, I think no matter how new that partnership might be, whether it just started in a new project or whether it's a really mature one, like a 20 year long uh, institution to institution relationship, I really want to make sure that there's that space for honest conversation and that we can truly talk about, hey, what are some points of improvement? What can we really build on together to really leverage each other's strengths and each other's skills? Because inevitably the skills that I don't have, they have. And so we really complement each other well in that sense for a lot of my partnerships. And so I really like to try and make sure that we're always finding opportunities together to grow and learn together. And I think having that, um, that long view and just, you know, treating my community partners like I would my family and friends, I think really has um, been very important to me. And also being able to share important milestones with each, with each other and to, to cherish them together. So if we have good news in our lives, that's personal, that might not be related to work. We still want, to, I still want to talk to my community partners about it because I call them my friends and not just my colleagues or my community partner, but I really just want to have, have these moments of bonding and, and moments of, you know, hanging out together, going wine tasting together, whatever that is, really having that time and really building that um, trust to me is important. Thanks, Lester. Um, BJ, is there anything you'd like to add? Um, yeah, I guess maybe I'll just get into the weeds a little bit. Um, you know, for in academia, there can be no EJ practice or research without a relationship, right, with the impacted communities to define those needs. Um, you know, what question or problem um, are we tackling? Um, and then to guide the work, right, how we do it. So without having that, our research risks being irrelevant, um, possibly even harmful to the communities that we think we are serving. So we need to know and understand the needs and that takes a relationship with the community and that takes time, right? So, um, I know that it's not how a lot of academic researchers historically are accustomed to working, but um, I'd argue that initiating an environmental health research project without a plan to involve community is kind of akin to malpractice. Um, and initiating an environmental health research project with a plan to involve community can be too. Um, the community needs to be involved before we initiate research the relationships and the questions that we learn through that have to come first. So this isn't just in the community's interest, but it's also in ours if we want our work to be relevant. Um, and I guess finally, I, I wanna quote um, Adrian Hampton, who's the Duwamish River Cleanup Coalition's policy manager, um, relationship building and power sharing are integral. The research goals and questions that we have um, should reflect the community's goals and questions. Our methodology should be informed by community um, perhaps most important for those of us in academia, um, we owe our publications as well to the communities who facilitate our research, and we need to acknowledge them accordingly. So sometimes that means taking a backseat to our collaborating community scientists when we publish, um, and I realize that that requires um, changes in the institutions and the incentives that drive a lot of this work, um, and yeah, it does. <laughs> That's great. Thank you, BJ. And thanks for mentioning power sharing. Um, and we'll get into that a little bit later. Um, 
This question speaks to some of the themes that you've already brought up, but um, an important criticism of, of health research uh, and research in general is the concept of helicopter research where scientists show up to a community, collect data, um, and then just leave without the community seeing the results of the research or realizing any benefits from the research. Um, and one way to kind of mitigate that type of research happening is to be accountable to the community that you're working with. Um, so our question is, um, as someone working to promote environmental justice, who are you accountable to in your work? And um, how are you held accountable or how do you hold yourself accountable? Um, and Esther, would you like to go first? Sure. Um, I feel like I hold myself accountable to the communities that I directly partner with. Also knowing that when I'm working with partner, uh, community partners and we have a meeting or we have some space to gather, there are also those that are unable to gather and being mindful of them and also trying to be accountable to those as well. So, so really making sure that we're hearing from those that we are not able to hear from or that are not able to participate. And so in the conversations that I have, and we really try to do this at the very beginning and all throughout the process is really making sure we set expectations for each other and that they're very clear from us. Hey, I expect you to do this. We want to do this together. What is our goal together? Um, and then we really visit, revisit that together. And so in a way for my research capacity, I really respond to and and try to hold myself accountable to those I work with and work for, and to make sure that I'm responding like BJ had mentioned and Mohammed had mentioned, really understanding the needs of the community and being able to respond to them and, and also always making sure that I'm talking to them to make sure that what I think is a response is, is what they wanted to see and, and doing that gut check, doing that two-way conversation and making sure that, because I think ultimately, you know, we all want the same thing, want the same goal, but it's, you know, how you get there and who you involve, I feel like that's so important. And, Part of our discussion today is making sure that we're really accountable for our actions and really being mindful of the unintended consequences as, as well because even if our intention is all rosy and great there are always that unintended consequences that i think we might learn about later on and if those happen because those will inevitably happen from time to time i'm really making sure that we we have that space to break it down together and learn from it so it's not repeated and also acknowledging that you know when it does happen having that space and providing that um, that conversation, I think is super important rather to say, oh, it's whatever that one time thing, I'm just gonna move on. And so I think in that way, being accountable for my own actions is super critical to the communities that I work with and work for. Thanks, Esther. Um, Mohammed, would you like to go next? Yeah, I wanna be brief here. So yeah, accountability comes as a public servant, or uh, we are accountable to taxpayers, the whole King County community. But at the same time, the projects that we do, we are also accountable to the community that we engage and the partners. And anything that Esther and BJ have said, I agree with that. But also I wanna bring another eyes or hats that I wear, which is from the community themselves which is really very interesting. And that has something that we need to change, which is changing now. As part of the Somali Health Board, there has to be some interest in the community when the researchers come and, and whether all those kind of a helicopter approach of coming and getting the data and then not even showing up back, all those things has changed since we empowered or stood up for the community because that kind of grassroots community-driven approach really works when they push back from the researchers themselves, from the county or anybody who's coming to get information. So it is not a one-way direction. It has to be a bilateral. It has to be bidirectional. It has to be from the community. Nobody says no, because when you are talking about their own health, their own community's health, but what normally we tend to do is we know the best, and then any way that we can get information out of this community or out of this because we are building our proposals or, or publications or those kind of things. And then lately, what has come with these new health boards, I think everybody's familiar with them, is 
Yes, they are. From the get-go, you make them the decision. It's from the planning to the finishing and then the authorship also of those articles and then the reports. Really, that's very hell. That is very important. Thank you, Liz. Yeah, so my health board is only one, but there are also other now 20, more than 20 health boards that came up, which are already being empowered, being vocal and advocating for their own health and the community's health. Thank you. Thank you. And BJ, is there anything you want to add on that? And then also, um, I just want to draw your attention to the chat because you had a, a comment there. I don't know if you want to speak to that too. Um, well, really, all I, I guess all I would add is um, when you build the kind of long-term relationships, friendships, family ships, you know, that Esther was talking about, um, one of the benefits of that is your communities will hold you accountable. <laughs> So yes, um, I do feel accountable to the community. And if I slip up, I will hear about it. Um, and I appreciate that. So um, those, those relationships really help, I think, us to stay centered in that accountability to the community. And you know, as an employee of the UW, I work under the assumption that I'm employed to serve the community. And I hope, you know, um, Mohammed mentioned, you know, being in public service and um, at its best, that's what a public university is as well. Great. Thank you. Um, so I just wanted to let everyone know that after this next question, um, we're going to be moving into the Q&A. So if you haven't already, please submit your questions through the through the Q&A box. Um, and if you don't mind when you submit questions, also including your affiliation, um, and that way we can prioritize questions from students. Um, so our next question is about power sharing. Uh, and it's, can you share an example of when you shared power away from yourself and away from your institution in your environmental justice work. And just tell us a little bit about that example, that experience. Um, and BJ, would you like to start? Um, sure. Uh, so in my former work um, before the university, um, the best thing that I did, I think, in all of the years that, um, that I was honored to work directly with the Duwamish communities was to get the hell out of the way. <laughs> um, so, you know, as the founding coordinator, I had a relationship already with many of the um, community organizations that were working on the Superfund cleanup um, of the Duwamish River. And, um, and I had some particular skill sets that were useful, um, but as the community gained those skill sets as the organizations built their capacity um, and as the the work progressed if I had stayed and kind of become you know the evolving director um, of that that early effort that organization would not be anything like the powerhouse that it is today um, or as progressive as it is today so I think sometimes getting out of the way is the absolute best thing um, and and I guess just kind of leave it there but um, but here at the university of uh, we are um, in the middle of an experiment at um, power sharing right now the the edge center has recently entered into um, an MOU to partner with a group of academics government agencies and primarily um, community organizations and that agreement centers community leadership in research around air pollution, um, in this case in the Duwamish Valley. The agreement requires community consultation and approval of all applications that we consider putting in for funding, um, research design, data sharing, um, and publications. So um, one early outcome of that effort um, is a proposal to conduct a five-year air quality and asthma mitigation project. Um, that was submitted to NIEHS, uh, and that's a partnership between a UW epidemiologist and the director of the Duwamish River Cleanup Coalition as co-PIs, right? Not as a hierarchical relationship. Um, 
And then there are also publications coming out of that partnership with community science scientists um, as co-authors on those papers. So we're learning from that partnership every day um, and it's definitely not easy and it takes time, but um, it's trying to lift community power and it's really exciting to be a part of. And I hope that with the lessons that we're learning, um, we can design a replicable model for, um, for other projects here at UW and for our partners going forward. Great. Um, Mohammed, would you like to share? Sure. Uh, power sharing that we have done with the community, I would pick one or two, but I will be very brief. So this is happening in a childhood lead poisoning program, and we are having interest because of our data, the trend, and what we are seeing from a segment of the county or a community with a language, a specific language, that we have an interest to reach out and partner with them because all the tools we had did not work because it's still, that pipeline is still producing a lot of uh, cases. So we generated a small grant to partner with the community just to establish uh, that kind of relationship learning from the community, getting to know each other, that trust building that everybody agreed that it takes time. It's not a matter of having a timeline to make that relationship. There is no timeline for it. It, is, it has an opening and it goes as it goes and you will never get 100% till you make it that effort. So that's what we have done and we are listening and learning from each other. And then what I'm trying to tell here is so the community now has built some relationship. It may have been easier because of uh, having some kind of, uh, some roots being immigrants and the target of the community were also some immigrants from another continent. I came from Africa, they came from Asia. So, but at least it helped because of that relationship of having refugees and immigrants and that kind of uh, knowing and having the common history. That may have helped, but at the same time, we have to go through the same procedure that we have done with anybody else. That trust is not something that you can get easily. So the first grant helped us, the community to collide with us, to co-create with us a project that fits well with them. We supported with the technical support. We given them the data, but at the same time, what, what came out from the first year of engagement was a project that was driven them. And then that became a second year and third year and fourth year to help us, all the community to get where we wanted. So with that partnership, the cases that went down from, I'm talking about the closing cases and then also retesting and all those kind of specific really improved because of the partnership that we have built. It takes time. But at the same time, you need that first year to build that relationship and get the gain, gain the trust from the community. And that's what really helped us with that segment, with that community. Okay. Thank you. Um, Esther, do you want to talk a little bit about sharing power? Yeah, a lot of examples come to mind, but I think for um, sharing power with my community partners, the the biggest example that comes is the environmental health disparities mapping project where it was our department actually responding to the requests from the communities and a community coalition in particular front and centered um, that wanted help creating a tool together. And so it was kind of a joint partnership that came together with different government agencies and a lot of community um, community organizations in our department. And there, you know, it's easy for researchers to kind of go in with their, hey, these are specific games. This is a timeline. These are when we're going to publish. These are when we're going to seek for the, our next renewal of funding. Uh, for this project, they actually front and center took the steering wheel and they said, hey, let's meet at this pace. They set the pace for us. And then we were there to, to be there and to be that, you know, give that technical support for some of the things that they didn't have in house, but to work with them to get to the goals that they wanted to. And so um, they held us accountable for all the, you know, meeting agendas and saying, okay, well, this is our to-do list and making sure I was a student at the time, but even if I had classes and other things, I had to hold myself accountable for those commitments because they were 
they were a thing that front and center wanted us to do and, and to, to respect. And so one of the, uh, I think it was, you know, about halfway through, we, want, we wanted to do frequent report backs to communities and to others and get their input. And me being, you know, liking purple and liking blue and liking UW, um, I used our school colors to make a presentation and then like floated it out to my external partners and community partners. And, and I got on the phone with one of my community um, partners and they said, too much purple like branding is everything it might seem like such a small thing but this is a joint project and so if it is conveyed with the purple and the gold then it's going to give that impression of this is a UW led UW initiated UW everything and so to me that was kind of a really big learning moment and thinking okay I really need to be intentional and thoughtful about every little thing and and not just think about those big moments of intentionally sharing power whether it's sharing the budget making them um, co-investigators making sure we're responding to the needs of the community but going down to the, even the smallest thing which I really hadn't thought about until we had that on a conversation about just even thinking about branding and communications material and how we talk about the partnership together and even if say I led the technical piece it still is a joint partnership and they brought their expertise to the community listening sessions and facilitating and organizing and so come bringing that together, really thinking about how we talk about partnerships and how we convey that to the, the greater world, I think was a really big lessons learn, lesson learned for me about sharing power. Oh, thanks, Esther. Um, and thanks everyone for just a great conversation. Um, I think we're gonna move towards the Q&A part of the evening. Um, and let's see. So please feel free to keep submitting questions. Um, let's see, okay, I'll start with this first one. So I think that, um, I think, yeah, anyone who wants can answer this one. It'd be great to hear from all three of you. Um, so in your work, is environmental justice more about fixing environmental justice risks and issues existing in communities rather than forward designing community structures that minimize or eliminate EJ risks and assure environmental protections are functioning. Feel free to just unmute yourselves, whoever wants to start. Can I just start by saying one thing, um, which is I, my first instinct is to say neither. It's about building power. And I will pass it off to Esther and Mohammed with that. Yeah, I can speak a little bit, at least to the communities that I work with and work for. Um, thinking about, you know, this community structure and designing, I think it is kind of that, you know, the empowerment and the capacity building and all of it to get to that, you know, permanently resilient and resilient communities that they envision themselves to be and restoring a lot of the historical harms and whatnot, but really thinking about ways to heal and, and to do that transition in a very just and equitable way because for example, in policy, there are lots of things now trying to convert to clean energy and making sure that co-benefits are shared with the communities and intentionally um, shared with the communities. But thinking about that, it's an, like every opportunity, those are all opportunities for us to think about how and bring communities to the middle of the conversation about how we can shape our process that, um, that as academics we support to make sure that we get to the vision and to get to the ultimate um, to bring power back to the communities um, for those that feel like they, they've lost it, but also making sure that it's centered around the community vision that they all want and, and dream of and, and are working towards. Thank you. So um, in my personal view, let me add this to the conversation, which is what I'm hearing is, and what I'm responding, as a public health or trying to do the core function of the public health, which is uh, assessing uh, the health hazards that really normally, whether it is outside or inside, whatever it is the issue is, and then solving it. Sometimes you feel that you are kind of doing the fire, fire work that just being called on and go out and put it out 
that fire and then go for the next and wait for the next call. So that is sometimes that's how it seems and that's how, that's how it really, and then what typically needs to be happening is, yeah, I think a broader sense of otherwise this will produce, keep on producing if we don't change. For example, in the lead world that I am familiar with, if we don't remediate and prevent from the, all those kind of work, prevention is the cornerstone of our work, but we don't have any funding to go about that. So that is what's missing, whether it is removing all those kind of existing sources of exposure, whether it is super fun or here and there, all those kind of things exist. And then we are coexisting it peacefully and hoping it to work. And that's what we are doing. And that's how we are responding to cases. And that's how we are living with what all these risks that we live with. I will stop there. Thank you. So this next question, um, again, I think could be directed towards any of the speakers. Um, is often the burden of addressing systemic or environmental justice issues falls on the backs of people of color. How can institutions create more trust and transparency to solve these issues? So talking about um, kind of more of those root causes, I think. I think it goes back to something that I think BJ mentioned earlier and really thinking about how our institutions are shaped, how rewards, how the evaluation systems are, how the rewards are, thinking about all of that and really trying to break those down, break the barriers down because um, I think, yeah, there, it is putting a lot of burden the way that we do things, putting a lot of burden on the community, on people of color, those, those folks that have less resources often um, or have just more barriers to and, and hurdles to, to go over. And so I think thinking about trust and transparency, A, it takes a lot of time and a lot of intentional action, but I think it really has to go down to, and I know School of Public Health had started um, even offering, you know, always offering compensation for community partners when they're invited as guest speakers, which is a great step forward, but you know that shouldn't be where we stop. We need to keep pushing past that and thinking about how can we really think about co-teaching co our future trainees together and thinking about community engagement and community partnerships so that it's not just us inviting folks to and community partners to our space, it's really us stepping into theirs and having them teach in their, um, in their own community, in their own environment, rather than bringing them into the traditional lecture with us standing in the front, students sitting in the back, that type of thing. Can I add a little bit on that so early? So yeah, I think, thanks Esther. So you reminded me about uh, an initiative that we are trying to implement, which is empowering or the, building the capacity of the community. There's a lot of, knows and, and progresses and policy that we can do because of uh, union and other stuff. What I'm saying is we have inspectors that go out and do assessment and investigate in the house of interest. And then we are thinking about now using a lot of skills, transferring a lot of skills to empower the communities to be the educators of their, of their community, and also having the skills of assessing the house hazards of their, of their community. So that is what really, what we call it, a community health advocates or community uh, and health workers and also ambassadors that we use all those names in the public health practice. I think that is something that we are doing now lately and it is working for this segment of the work that I'm doing because uh, our inspectors when they don't have the language and the culture skills and there is also racial differences for example I have a white Caucasian female in my inspector or that is the list of people that I do have and then we are trying to serve a cultural immigrant background with a lot of history and trauma and then that trust 
never existed and that's what we are trying to solve. And then we, when we empowered with the community with our pro equity contracting and also capacity building, and now they are stepping up to do that kind of a work for themselves, that is what really we are trying to do. Hopefully it works and that's really should work. Thanks. Thank you. BJ, is there anything you want to add for this question? Okay. So the next question we have is um, communities in Detroit, Michigan, affected by lead exposures in their drinking water learned that the system failed them and that they needed to be proactive and informed, including with evidence. So what skills and actions like uh, data, leadership skills, political advocacy, et cetera, are community members and leaders affected by the EJ work you are involved with wanting to build so they are better empowered as partners and advocates? So I think Mohammed, you just spoke to a lot of um, a lot of these themes. I don't know if anybody, if you want to add anything more to that or Esther and BJ, if you like to answer. Well, again, kind of, you know, my deepest involvement is with the Duwamish communities. And this is a, this is actually a very big theme. Um, they want access to and training in how to be able to monitor conditions in their own environment. So whether that's, um, you know, air monitors for the things that they're concerned about or being able to sample, you know, their community gardens or their own backyard garden. Um, you know, they, they want the, they want access to the tools and the training to use them. Um, and there's a couple of efforts right now underway um, from different parts of the university and not, not just folks that I work with that are attempting to um, find creative ways to meet that need. And I'm um, optimistic, um, but you know, it's, there's, uh, there's a lot of hurdles to overcome to make sure that, um, that we can really share resources in that way. Um, but I, I think it's essential. I think one of the strategies that I have employed in the past um, is when I see funding opportunities or when I see different um, opportunities that come up, I try to make sure that I'm not fitting what what I think communities want into that. I'm making sure that I talk to the communities you know, ahead of time so I know what their needs are. And then if a funding opportunity comes up, I make it work. I make I make it work. I try to bring in the funds, but really making sure that we are focused on yeah, the, the goals of the community and the skills and the actions that they want to build, they want to build in-house. And also having that conversation because they don't always want to learn R and, and learn some of those software that we all do in class, but really thinking about um, what they want to bring, what they want to bring to the table and what they hope to really grow more and hold that skill, you know, in-house and what they want to, um, so for, I guess, as an example, uh, we've worked with different partners in the past, like health clinics, and they have community health workers. And so knowing, knowing that as an asset and knowing that what they want to build on as more skills, we find ways to support that through some of our research projects, but really making sure that that's a priority and we're not making community needs fit to our mold, but making sure that we are fitting the needs of the communities is one of the strategies that I've tried. That's great. Uh, Mohammed, was there anything you wanted to add here? Um, no, I think that's, that's enough. Is there any question or? There's another question, yeah. Um, so we can move on to the next one. Um, so this question is, if you develop a deep relationship with the community, how do you bring their history and perspectives to the community you come from, whether your family, your academic peers, et cetera? I don't know if anyone has any examples of, of that. That's an interesting question. So can you repeat, please? How do you bring you all? Can you, please? Yeah, of course. Um, so if you develop a deep relationship with a community, how do you bring their history and perspectives to the community that you come from, whether that's like your family community or your academic peers or any other community that you're part of? 
Um, let me start by saying um, what I was referring earlier, which is applicable to this, this question is, um, it happened to be serving and responding issues in a, a refugee a community that came as a refugee for recent refugees while I am a, someone who stayed here over two decades. And first they identify you by first time that they meet them, they find out your name and other things, not only them, even when I'm introducing myself to anybody, the first thing that comes to mind is, are you Muhammad Ali, the boxer, or those kind of stuff? So people will identify you, who you are, and they relate to you depending on where are you coming from, so that humanity exists. But that is the only one thing, because now we are talking about, while I am Muhammad from an black male, Muslim background, all that kind of uh, identities that I bring, I bring to the conversation. But at the same time, one thing that I never, I overlooked in the past was the power that I bring to the conversation. People see you as a government entity. People scare of you. And people know you that you sometimes you are a spy for the government or doing something else. At least relating to that history of that where they came from, relating to them. So it at least speeds up the process of connecting and building that trust. That is one segment. But then that kind of what Esther was saying earlier, which is even sharing what, what are you doing and how's the family, you're married with kids, how long have you lived here? All those kind of histories really becomes part of you because you are meeting them you are giving them the power of them putting together the agenda. They are feeling empowered. They are taking the lead of planning the, the meetings, where we're gonna meet, what the topic will be, who's gonna be talking, when they feel that kind of a power sharing and also becoming a, one of them. And then, I th yeah, that's part of that process of trust building. And that's really I would add there. Thank you. Esther or BJ, are you interested in answering that question? I can just say, I, you know, breaking bread, right? I mean, people need to meet each other. People need to have experiences with people whose background, whose experiences are different from their own. Um, so whether that means, you know, bringing community leaders into the classroom with compensation, uh, whether that means, you know, inviting them for dinner with your friends and your family and literally breaking bread. Um, one way I did it, Hillary opened with the meeting, so I had to write it down in a book and my community folks that I gotten to know wouldn't let me stop when I got discouraged. Um, Cause that's, you know, whether it's a magazine article or, you know, a documentary or a book kind of in the broader society, those are other ways to do it. but. But just the interpersonal itself, which I think is more what this question is um, is asking, is really powerful. I think just the only thing I'll add is, you know, the stories and the stories I hear and the stories I share with others, you know, I really value them. And it's it can get tricky when, you know, you go into another environment without your community partners and you're trying to retell their stories. You know, it's their stories are their own and, and it's their lived ex experience. And so I really try to make sure that I'm not um, that I don't borrow their stories without their permission or anything and, and making sure that when when we do talk about their stories in their space that it isn't done in a way that they, they would like. And so that's, I think, one important thing that I imagine BJ's book, which I will read soon, and really does, which is the art of storytelling. Yeah, that's so important. Um, we have another question here. So it's kind of long. So let me know if you want me to repeat any part of it. Um, does community-based justice-oriented research conflict with traditional research funding models? For example, um, how does one describe a programmatic or evaluation plan and a grant proposal 
if part of the proposal is to work with the community to identify their own needs and targeted outcomes? Or should one work with the community to identify those needs before seeking funding? Also, is it typical for grant applications to allow community members or leaders to be PIs? So I think BJ, you spoke to this a little bit. I don't know if you wanna start us off expanding um, on what you've already talked about a little bit. Um, I did already speak to it, so I won't repeat myself, but, uh, but one of the things that I know we are um, hoping to include in one of our projects coming up is an, an actual um, empowerment evaluation written into a scientific research project, which should be an interesting add-on um, if it gets funded and, and can report back later on how that works. Okay, well, stay tuned. Esther or Muhammad, would you like to add anything? I think these questions are really important to ask because I, I don't know if there is a an easy answer for any of these. I think you know it is a barrier for community partners to talk to you about their needs and priorities when they have other things to do because their primary goal isn't research. And so they need to then carve out some of their time to talk to you about how what their needs are and whatnot when they could be doing other be in other spaces like serving their community. And so I think the challenges that um, some of these questions I think are coping to tackle like the traditional research funding mechanisms or thinking about how to really fold in community and and give them power, give them back the power that they should have had um, through these traditional mechanisms, you know, thinking about allowing community leaders to be PI or co-PIs, I think all of that really needs a system change and we're slowly getting there. I'm seeing more of like more grant opportunities that really value these community partnerships and want that to be an integral part of the plan. Um, I think there have been a couple around like COVID, for example, or in environmental health, NIHS has a couple around research to action that really emphasize these partnerships. And so more are kind of becoming more and more prominent, but also, I feel like foundations play a bigger role in kind of bridging some of that. And so oftentimes through different types or when, like I think um, BJ had mentioned, getting really creative with how you can find support for your community partners to have that space and conversation. And sometimes it might be really informal, but I don't know if I'm answering any of the questions posed, but I really think it's, it's a challenge that we'll, we'll all be tackling together to really create that change. Thank you. So yeah, it is a tough question. So what I would add also something that came to mind while Esther was talking. Um, the traditional research used to work and it may continue to work, but at the same time, the community participatory research is, I think, something that preferable, working with the community, and that really model might help you get the needs assessment that you are proposing. And secondly, on um, what I'm now referring is the organization or the nonprofit that I'm involved with the Somali Health Board. Uh, it is now things have changed. We are becoming part of the research and we have done a lot of research with UDAP, whether it is from infectious diseases, which is an and also to COVID. Lately, COVID testing was an, a topic that we were part of it. And then two from the community leaders, the executive and also uh, Dr. Anissa were the co-author of the study. So those are really something that it is not starting because you are mentioning and you are talking about our community. And then why not us being part of it? That is something that is really happening and that's really encouraged because you want community to be a part of the solution. You don't want to be the savior. You want to be only the person who picks out and identifies an issues and then waits until he comes with the solutions. So I think the worst, the best in my understanding as an immigrant person, as someone who's been impacted all these issues is being part of that. Whatever it takes, I know it is not easy, but let us know if you need any help, but that is really what, that's the ultimate goal. Thank you all so much. Um, so this next question is actually for Hillary. Um, so it is, 
how do we establish scholars of practice as a way of enhancing partnerships? Such a position would enable community members to participate in instruction, advising, and mentorship of students and faculty. Yeah, this is a fantastic question. And actually something that was sort of running through my mind as, as people were talking as well. Um, I think I would, I would modify it slightly actually. So we do have, um, and this is something that I think public health has been really um, as a discipline, a strong leader of um, within academia is um, creating um, positions for to bring our practice partners who might not have traditional academic credentials, um, but who are doing really important public health work um, to bring them in as um, affiliate faculty or clinical faculty. Um, and also um, we, we even have it at the University of Washington, it's not used very often, um, a professor of practice um, uh, series as well. Um, but what I think the essence of Tom of what you're getting to actually to me sounds more like a community scholar. So someone who um, may not be um, trained in public health or working in public health practice, um, but who brings their own lived experience and their, their own set of expertise and skills to um, the work that we're trying to do together. And I would love for us to think really creatively about how we might create some, some community scholar positions um, that would really honor that, that expertise that, that our partners are bringing um, in a way that we really, I, I don't think we have something like that um, currently, but I'd love to hear and yeah, and have them um, have formal recognition for the richness that they bring to um, the way that we train our students and, and mentor our students, it would be fantastic. So I'd love to hear from the panelists if they have other ideas about how we might actualize that, that suggestion. Thanks, Hillary. I don't know if any of the panelists want to speak to that. I think the only thing I'll say is, you know, we should keep having this conversation. <laughs> that way we can really think about um, these, because I think these conversations have come up time and time again. And I think when I started as a student, I had heard this conversation. And so, yeah, it's, a, it's I think, a hard one, but we should all work towards it. Yeah, I'll just say that um, I haven't been here very long, so I don't know how the system works well enough to get creative like that with it. But um, but we have I have run into barriers with you know classes and trainings that we really desperately need, both for our students and for our faculty and staff, that we just don't have the internal capacity and to do. And um, and it sounds like there's not a lot of, of room for hiring externally um, when we do need those things. So if this is one way that it can happen, um, I'm all for it. Mohammed, is there anything you'd like to add? Um, not much, but I think continuing with this kind of uh, student internships, and vice versa between academia and the practice. I don't know if, if it is enough. We receive some students from environmental health or public health or that come to public health to intern. And then we have seen the, how useful they, they are learning the practice, but at the same time, they produce a quality work in a short time. So maximizing those kind of uh, initiatives is really very helpful. And one thing that I realized, and I attest to that, where Hillary mentioned about uh, an affiliate faculty from the community practice. I think, yes, I know, and I've seen it, maybe one or two uh, that I know of, I'm talking about. So yeah, I think those are really very important. People may not have, public health degree, but they have other degrees and lived experience, and they are transforming and playing a role in the public health in the county. 
So if you don't take advantage of that, those kind of opportunities, I think that there's a lot of uh, waste resources and unused or untapped resources in the county. So vice versa. So the community, there's a lot of outstanding contributors to the public health. And we have uh, some candidates, uh, not candidates, or they have affiliates from our community in the global health. And that's one thing. But also, yeah, I think there's a lot of resource in the community that needs to be tapped on. Thank you. Thank you all so much. This has been a great conversation um, and some kudos in the chat. <laughs> um, we just have one last question to close it out. And that is, how do you envision your environmental justice work changing in 2021 and beyond? And Esther, would you like to start? Yeah, that's such a big question because I feel like just 2020 and the beginnings of 2021 have been such a rough year for everyone and some communities hurting more than others and but also 2021 we're seeing I think some hope and some paths to return to a better normal than we had before for many of our communities and so I'm really hopeful that the work that I do and the research I do can support these you know communities to thrive more and and to think about ways where um, where I can be helpful to them thank you BJ, would you like to share? Um, it's, it's not really for me to say uh, because I see my job as continuing to be responsive to communities leadership and community needs. Um, so I will need to ask them. <laughs> um, but I assume that overall um, it's going to continue to be more intersectional more explicitly address systemic racism um, and also that every issue will touch, you know, somehow, somewhere on climate change. Thank you. Mohammed, do you like the last word? Thank you. So I think funding is a key. And as we know, public health is chronically underfunded. And we have seen it during the COVID-19 pandemic, which is still going on and winding hopefully down. So taking on environmental justice issues, I think it needs a drastic uh, change in the funding. And also one thing that I would love that the opportunity that too came up in during this period was about the racial justice and racial equity conversation is becoming uh, the talk of the norm, it is, it's being normalized and being now being talked and also all strategies from the leadership, from uh, the county and the public health. And also I think you would have putting what it is and also trying to figure it out how to solve it is becoming something that's on the table. For us, we are thinking about racial equity, result-based accountability, something that I will leave with you, which is a new tool that we are thinking of. It is a racial equity, result-based accountability. We are diving down into the root causes of issues. And instead of band-aid and all the time staying with the upstairs and all the time covering up and things are moving up, we are now trying to dig deeper and figure out the route and the hot routes, and then now come up with solution and strategies to solve those hot issues. And that's the conversation that we are starting. Hopefully 2021 and beyond will bring uh, solutions to those hot spots. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, I'm gonna pass it on to Hillary now to conclude the program. Yeah, thank you, Orly, for being such an awesome moderator, and to all three of our panelists um, for sharing your your wisdom with us today and giving us some insights into the great great work that you're doing. Um, I wanted to also thank everyone in the audience for joining us today, and and for those of you who posed questions um, for for or, or just great comments um, for your active engagement. Um, please do check out. Um, our health equity lecture series webpage in the coming days. We will post the link 
to um, the recording from this event, and you can also find uh, links to recordings of our previous panels as well. Um, and I hope you will join us next Wednesday for our biweekly SPH COVID-19 webinar. Um, we have a really exciting topic for next week, which is that we're having several students from our undergraduate public health global health major come and talk about key findings from um, research projects that they did um, for one of their classes on topics related to COVID-19, including student risk perceptions, um, adherence to preventive measures, fear caused by social media, and much more. So really great opportunity to hear um, from our student voices. Um, again, thank you all so much. Uh, really appreciate um, both your being here with us today and also just the great work that you do. Um, wish you all um, good health and uh, well-being and um, a good evening. Bye.